Kings, the first book of the Kings. This summer we're looking at prayer, and this story on its face has little or anything to do with prayer, but I want to use it as a, a launching pad into our discussion this morning. This is the story of Elijah and a widow. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Arise, go to Zarephath, where belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. Now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Don't fear. Go and do as you have said, but first bring me a little cake and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day of the Lord, that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said. And she and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he had spoke by Elijah. Let's pray. Heavenly Fathers, we come to you today discovering in your word the one who is the word made flesh, discovering in your story our story, discovering in your good news a gospel that not only transforms our life, but transforms life around us. As we discover more of you, as we learn how to talk to you, we ask you to hear us with all the generosity and the graciousness that you are made of. Hear our prayers. Hear the fumbling, feeble words that come from our lips and do what only you can do and make them great. Speak, O oh Lord, for your church is listening. Amen. In prayer we talk to God is probably the most basic and most properly normal thing that you can say. If you ask anybody on the street what prayer is, they will tell you that it is some form of your conversation with God. And what they mean by that is that there is a variety of opinions about how effective that conversation is when it's a one-way conversation. As more than one comedian has put it, if you talk to God, you're religious. But if God talks to you, you might be schizophrenic. But the reality of how we talk to God is that how we talk to God is one of the most important things we can do in our life. And the number one reason that people often don't start a prayer practice or struggle to develop their prayer practice is because they rightly or, or properly feel that when they are standing in the presence of the Almighty God, the one who has created everything, the one who in the Lord's Prayer is our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, we properly and, and appropriately fill ourselves with all kinds of anxiety and worry when we approach prayer. The number one thing that I hear when I ask people to pray or how they pray or when we talk about prayer is that the thing that they'll tell me is that they don't want to pray out loud because they don't know what to say. And I want to affirm you that if that is you, if, if your struggle with prayer is that so often you don't know what it is that you are to say, if you don't have any words for that, well then let me, let me share this story of Elijah's good news with you. Because it, uh, for a widow, in the middle of drought and famine was to be one of the worst situations that you could find yourself in socio sociologically, economically, or any other way that you would measure that. To be a widow was to have no male figure in your life, no 
no figure for protection or comfort or care who could provide for your needs. There was no one in your life to work the field, and all that she has in this life is her son. So we, we glean from this that her husband has died relatively recently. Here she is, enwrapped and enfolded in a, in a blanket of grief and loss, as she grapples with not only the loss of her caretaker and her provider, but also her companion, her love, her, the, the father of her child. And all that she hears in the news is that nobody has food in their pantries anymore. Everybody's wells have run dry, and everything that they're trying to grow is withering on the vine for want of, of refreshment and sustenance. All around her is a pattern of death and desolation. And she is prepared to stand in the middle of that emptiness, to stand in the middle of that drought, and, and with her son by her side, make one last meal, one last feast of biscuits, that before she and her son accept their fate, that they are going to starve to death. For this widow, Desolation is in every corner of her world. Emptiness and barrenness are all that she has to hold on to. And so when Elijah comes and with a promise that she has been spoken to by God, comes and tells her what he needs, her response to him is simply to say, well, that I could do because God's told me to do it. But the reality is that it's not going to be enough for you either. Because if I do what I've intended to give to my son and myself and give it to you, surely our fate will be the same as yours. She's saying to Elijah, if you would like to sit at my table of emptiness, if you would like to sit in my companionship, in my family of desolation, if you would like to be at my barren table with me, then in this time, I will, I will give you what the Lord has required because that is all I have. Her output was constrained and limited by what she believed she had in reserve. The same is true often with our prayer life. In this season of, of learning and developing a prayer practice, we believe that the world of 2031, the world of our third century church, will need us to be a praying people. We believe at a fundamental level that the world outside our doors needs us to pray. And so the challenge of building a prayer practice is that so often we go to the cupboard and like that widow in Zarephath, our closets, our cupboards are empty. And so how do we pray when we pray, how do we pray when we feel like our souls are dusty and desolate? How do we develop a prayer practice, a practice of, of regularly communing with the God who made us and bringing him our, our prayers when we don't feel like we have the words to make those prayers happen? This is where God's provision goes before us. See, the reality of, of prayer is that at a, at a fundamental level, God's fingerprints are already all over your prayer life. When you pray corporately in church together with us, what God does is he elevates the words that you pray in echo with me or with whoever is praying, and, and God grabs hold of all of those prayers. He unites them together in the power of his spirit and joins them together and they become, in the words of Colossians, a fragrant offering poured out by the church for the blessing of the world. That, so if God's fingerprints are already all over our prayer, then we can take confidence in the fact that God is not going to simply ask us to come to him in prayer and then not give us the means by which to provide that prayer and this is where God's provision has been richly and abundantly given. Because in the middle of every single one of your Bibles, at the back of every single one of your hymn books, are at least 150 prayers that you can pray. We have, in, especially in the Reformed tradition, where there is an evangelical an evangelical current, we have a 
tendency to lionize people who can write or pray or spontaneously create their own, own prayers out of nothing. We value it when somebody can come and offer a concrete example of prayer off the top of their head. We love it and we, we prioritize it to the point that it is a skill that they actively search for in seminaries. But this, this, this fact negates the, the reality that for more than 1,500 years, the tradition of praying was not a tradition of writing your own novel prayers. In fact, it was frowned upon or shunned to write novel prayers because how could you improve upon the language that's already been given to you? And so for most of Christian history, for most of the church's story, the prayers that we've prayed are not written by us or not even given to us, but are in fact a treasury of, of prayers that we have inherited. There are 150 psalms in the book, uh, in the middle of your Bible that are, that are fit for service in any and all situations. The psalms are not simply scripture or poetry that's there for devotional exercise. They were and are the meat and potatoes of our prayer life. And we realize this when we, and when we open up the book of psalms to the very first psalm. If you have a Bible, I will invite you to turn with me. Somewhere around the middle of your Bible is Psalm number one. Psalm number one is, for all intents and purposes, the prototype of what a psalm was supposed to be. It tells you in the beginning what the psalms are intended for and how best to use them. So if we can get past Job here for one second. We see this. Psalm 1, blessed is the one who walks not in the counsel of wicked, but stands, nor stands in the way of sinners, or in the, sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law, on his word, in, order, in other words he's saying, he meditates day and night. Now this word meditates that the psalmist uses here is a particular word in Hebrew, and it, it's the word hagah, which is to, to essentially move your mouth in a recurring and a repeating structure. It's, it's the idea of, of putting, a, um, putting an everlasting gobstopper in your mouth and continually having to work it in order to get at the sweet center of what's there. This psalm is the reason that Eugene Peterson wrote his great commentary on the psalms and called it, Eat This Book, because the reality of what the psalmist is inviting us to consider here is that the psalms, the, the law of the Lord, the word of God is not something to be simply read or, or, or recited, but is meant to be slowly digested and chewed on. To meditate on something is to chew actively on it. In fact, that's what, that's the same, it's the same kind of uh, phrase that Jesus uses when he says in John chapter 7 that anyone who eats of my body, anyone who eats of the word of the Lord, the flesh of God, will come in and know me. And so the invitation from the Psalms is that these are not simply songs that we sing or, or words that we say in order to get through them, but they are meant to be slowly digested and chewed on. And so that through, these, through this, this practice of, of chewing and intentionally digesting the Psalms, they become a prayer life in and of themselves. The Psalms were for the church for most of its history, the songbook that we sang from. In fact, it was up until, it wasn't, it wasn't until relatively recently that the Presbyterian Church in Canada even allowed music other than the Psalms to be written. In fact, while I was still in seminary, we had to take, we had to take an actual course on metrical Gregorian chant because just in case we ended up in a church that didn't want to have music. We could still lead the chanting of the psalms. Fortunately, no one is asking me to sing for you. <laughs> but the reality of this was, was as simple as any instruction that we give to any children. We teach our kids lessons by inviting them to sing them, don't we? 
because we understand what St. Augustine told us, that the one who sings prays twice. When you sing something, there is a level at which you internalize it that's deeper than simply rationality. I can say, I, I can stand up here and I can tell you all 12 provinces in 10 provinces and, and now three territories, but when I was in school, there's only two. I can tell you all those, but I can tell you them a lot easier if I can sing the song I learned to, to memorize them to. When you're alphabetizing something, you still probably sing the alphabet song to yourself. Hey, Kai, what's up, dude? We sing because singing is our natural, singing is the language of our soul. It is how, it is the reason that the songs that you sang will always be with you. My, uh, so Beth's Oma uh, passed away a couple of years ago. Maybe I've told this story before, but she was 90 uh, old years old when she finally passed away. And for the last 10 years or so, she struggled with deep and abiding dementia. Visiting her was a joy because the glimmers of who she used to be still shone through from time to time, but most of our conversations revolved around the weather or different things. And every so often, though, we'd go for these walks, and we'd walk through the beautiful gardens of her retirement community, and in the middle of the garden in this gazebo was a, uh, an outdoor piano. And every time without fail, no matter who she, you know, no matter how bad her dementia was on any given day, she would walk and she would sit down at this dusty, old, broken piano and she would place her fingers exactly where they needed to go and she could play and sing every verse to my Jesus, I love thee. Because deep in her soul, that song had taken root. That song had taught her that her prayer life was more than just the words she could say. That song was how she, re she regained her practice of prayer even through the thickest night of dementia. The, pr the, the psalms that become us, the songs that become us, are the way we develop our practice of prayer. And the most effective way that you can develop your practice of prayer is to sing your songs every day. I don't care if it, it, what song it is, it is a prayer, if it is, a, if it is a song of praise and worship to God, then it is fit for your practice of prayer. But if you're like me, and you're not a singer, or if you're like me, and people leave the room when you start to sing, then the Psalms might be your best friend. And I can tell you this because I've watched this happen. A couple weeks ago, I, I mentioned my grandmother and her prayer practice. My grandfather had a prayer practice as well that I have become something of the beneficiary of. After my grandmother passed away, my grandfather started a project of going through a psalm every single morning, which he has done faithfully and religiously for nearly 20 years at this point. He has gone through the entire psalm book at that point, at this point now, probably more times than I can count. And a year or so ago, he decided that he was going to take on a project. He put down, he wrote, a, he wrote every single psalm as a prayer that he could pray, that we could pray, that anyone can pray. This was my devotional this morning. See if you can place it. You, O oh Lord, have always been our shepherd and constant companion, providing us with everything we really need. Productive green pastures, quiet streams of refreshing, restoring waters that keep us healthy. You lead us in safe and right paths, whether to the mountain tops of joy or the valleys of suffering and death, you promise to always be with us, supporting us, guiding us, and guarding us all the way. Our tables are always full of good food, even in the presence of hunger and poverty. Our lives are anointed by your blessing, and our cups are full and running over. How secure are we in knowing your goodness and mercy all the days of our life here on earth and the knowledge that we will dwell forever with you in your house beyond this life. 
Glory to you, Jesus Christ, our good shepherd. In the waters of baptism, you give us new birth, and at your table, you nourish us with heavenly food. And in your goodness and mercy, you guide us beyond the terrors of evil and death to your Father's home to dwell in eternal light. The Psalms are more than just a book that we can ignore in the middle of our Bible. They are a tool that you are encouraged and empowered to use in developing your own prayer practice. My invitation to you is, as you've been developing this prayer practice over the last couple of weeks, how is it going? How are you finding your ability to talk to God? For some of you, the Lord's Prayer has been your constant companion through this journey. I've been told stories of families saying the Lord's Prayer together each night before they go to sleep, holding hands under the covers and praying those familiar words. I've heard stories of people beginning each day with a devotion and a prayer. But for me, this has been an invitation to meditate on each psalm. So each day, I open, the, I open my book of Psalms and I pray a simple line-by-line line reminder. The Lord is my shepherd. Be my shepherd, God. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. We read the Psalms because they are how God provides for us. They are God's way of being sure that you are never without words and that you are never alone in your practice of prayer. The Psalms are God's invitation to lean on his truth, to find his grace and his space, and through his provision, realize that the cupboard is never empty. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.